Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. We have with us today Friedrike, who's the director on the Blue Horizon Growth Investing Team. Besides her work as an investor and board director of portfolio companies, she co-authored the Food for Thought Report, published by Blue Horizon and BCG. Friedrike holds a PhD in plant biotechnology from the University of Oxford and has, a, has been a management consultant with BCG. She maintains a strong network in the scientific community and is excited about safeguarding humanity's long-term future. To this end, she co-authored work that informed the research agenda of Oxford's Global Priorities Institute and is an active member of the EA community. She's here with us today to talk about alternative proteins and sh how she got there. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, first of all. Um, and thanks all of you for joining. I would like to start, so this talk can basically take two different directions depending on what you are most interested in. So I would like, like to ask who is here for the technical aspect of technology priorities for animal-free foods and what needs to change and how that field is developing versus who is here for the careers aspect of how I got there and why it might make sense to do consulting or not and all of these questions. So who of you is mostly there for the technical aspect? Do you want to write? Okay, so there's a bunch of people interested in that. Who's mostly here for the careers aspect? Okay, so it's actually overlapping. Very good. We will just do the whole presentation then, um, and we will do a bunch of Q&A, and you can ask me anything about careers and technologies. Cool. So let's get started. Um, what I mean by alternative proteins is um, all of the things you see on here, so from plant-based things like your classical Alpro yogurt um, or Beyond Meat Burger, through, uh, through biomass fermentation, like corn, that is commercial in, in the UK, or meat tea, which you can get in the US, through precision fermentation-based proteins um, that are produced by companies like Every and Geltor. Um, they are available in very small quantities <laughs> with like pre-launches at this point, um, through to animal cell-based uh, cultivated meat type of products um, made by companies like Mosa Meat in the Netherlands. Those were the guys that made the first cultured meat burger in 20, I think, 13 for 130,000 bucks. So it was insanely expensive, but that technology has developed a bit since. Um, or Super Meat in Israel would be another example. The important bit to um, understand here is what I'm referring to is foods that remain, uh, that, that aim to replace animal-based foods one-to-one, -one. so it's not about tofu or pulses or things that, well, <laughs> vegan populations have been eating forever. Um, it is more about products that allow people to um, change their mind about animal suffering and about the climate impacts of eating meat um, without having to change their food too much. So this is really the underlying premise um, of the theory of, imp of impact for alternative proteins, <laughs> for me at least, is this is one way to help people to resolve this cognitive dissonance between I kind of think that animals probably suffer. I know that factory farming is really bad, but I want to have a steak. <laughs> so the products that I'm talking about are the ones that are trying to solve this dilemma, be it through plant-based or microorganisms, fermentation-based technologies, or um, animal cell-based. Then um, a word on me and, and what we do at Blue Horizon. So I'm an investor with Blue Horizon. Blue Horizon is um, a Zurich-based impact investing firm. Um, so we invest in private markets, in companies that are not publicly traded on the stock market, like Beyond would be publicly traded, but rather smaller startups, emerging companies um, that are traded on private markets. We invest across the whole sustainable food system. So alternative proteins is one part of what we do, but there's also things like sustainable agriculture, um, there's things like so production of sustainable packaging materials, so it is really that whole system around food and how do we make that more circular, more sustainable, um, less ethically dubious, so it is a lot about taking the animal out of the food system. Um, this is what we do. We try to invest consistently ahead of the curve because we are a sector-focused investor, so we have a lot of expertise um, and try to be ahead of changes like, yeah, uh, we managed to both buy and sell our Beyond Meat steak at the right time, so by the time the, cra the, the stock crashed, we were already back out. Uh, this is the, the sort of investment thesis behind Blue Horizon. 
We invest for a double positive, so we see impact as a value driver. Um, happy to go into, into more detail if that's of interest. It's basically a framework where we say, okay, in alternative proteins, we have this almost flywheel effect of every extra burger that you sell increases your revenue, which is nice from a business point of view. It also increases the impact that you have. So you are 100% aligned on impact is a, is a value driver and conversely, business success is a proxy for uh, positive impact. So <laughs> those are the areas that we seek out. Um, yeah, and the TV is going to turn off. No, okay. So that, that's what we do at Blue Horizon. A little bit on the technology priorities in all protein. Um, this is a graphic from a recent report that we published. Um, this is me at Blue Horizon and my old team at BCG. Um, as, as mentioned uh, before by Crystal, I was a management consultant with BCG. So we've teamed up and collaborated on uh, analyzing the sector of alternative proteins through a few publications. I will share the QR code for these in the end of the talk, so you can read them if you want to. And this is one of the graphics that we made to sort of look at the value chain of alternative proteins. So really from um, having an input material, growing a plant in most cases, harvesting that, then extracting proteins, formulating a final product, um, processing, texturizing that to get, for instance, like a mincemeat texture for beef or a chicken-like texture for, a replace, uh, for, for an alternative chicken and then finally going into packaging, distribution, and retail. So we really sort of looked at these different sectors of the value chain and we said, okay, where are there still bottlenecks where technology could emerge to solve these bottlenecks to make alternative proteins cheaper, tastier, healthier, and in the end of the day, increase the market share that these products have compared to traditional meat. So this is the the framework of the analysis. Um, we started out with looking at conventional proteins, so like animal-based, let's say you uh, grow some, the input here would be seeds, you grow some soy, you feed it to a chicken, you slaughter that chicken, um, and you sell the meat. And we kind of look at, okay, how does value accrue across the value chain? Who actually makes the most money per kilo of end product in that value chain? And in the case of meat, it is, the processing people. So the packaging, like the cutting the chicken breast out of the chicken and packaging it in, in a nice way and putting an MS label on it is the part that, that creates the most value. This is different for alternative proteins and our analysis then focused on how we think it is going to change over time and where we see technologies that need to still develop and where we could therefore invest. So the first one is plant-based. Um, here you go from seeds to crops and then to extracting protein and formulating an, an end product. I see um, quite a bunch of value in formulation these days. So you see that formulation is sort of the biggest blue bar on, on these slides um, for plant-based. Why is that? Because you need a bunch of ingredients next to a pea or a soy to make something that is appealing and performs like meat today still. Um, those could be flavors, they could be binders, they could be um, a flavor masking agents sometimes because if your chicken tastes like pea, some people don't like that, um, <laughs> turns out. Um, so there's a, a bunch of different ingredients that go into there, which is why a lot of value is created in formulation today. Um, the way the industry is changing at the moment is that more of that is happening actually in extraction. So by being a bit smarter of on how you work with the pea and how you extract the protein from the pea and how you process that. You can sometimes avoid the off flavors altogether so you don't need to mask them afterwards and you get a nice clean tasting plant-based chicken which has a nice short ingredient label, basically consists of pea starch, pea fiber, pea protein, salt and oil. Um, and this is what consumers also like because there is that perception of I want um, less processed, more natural kinds of foods. Um, and, and that helps with that. So we do see some um, increase of value in the extraction step to replace ingredients like methyl cellulose. Um, that, that is one of the binders that I alluded to. It is not a problem for human health. It doesn't really do anything in the human body. It just passes through, but it doesn't sound that nice on the label. And it is also used in tapestry glue. So it's kind of like 
yeah, do we really want to put that into food? Maybe not. So um, working with extraction to replace the need for um, extensive formulation. Then going into fermentation, so here the growth of, of microorganisms, could be bacteria, fungi, yeast, um, different types of microorganisms that, that you grow to make these alternative protein foods. Um, the value across the value chain is slightly different in terms of distribution here. You have a bit more value in the beginning because it is quite important what strain, so what sort of genetic makeup of your organism you use to go in here. Um, there's some strains that are known to work really well. There's a lot of people working on finding even better strains. Um, this is one of the cool things about microorganisms. There's so many different ones out there. <laughs> and the fact that we can now, as of the last couple of years, really very deeply sequence genomes and understand that biodiversity of how many microorganisms we have out there also means that we have a bunch of potential for value creation by just finding microorganisms that do what we want them to do without being toxic or problematic in other ways. Um, and that can actually help produce food. The important thing to note here is, this may sound a little bit scary um, and a little bit scientific, but humanity has been using microorganisms to make food basically forever. So fermentation is a process that we also use to make beer, bread, yogurt, um, more recently things like citric acid. <laughs> um, so it is fundamentally um, not a novel process, it's just about using microorganisms that we already know in different ways and finding more um, different ones that do exactly what we want. So this is the value creation on the strain side. Um, ideally, one would find strains here, and this is what a, a couple of the uh, companies in our portfolio are working on. Ideally, one would find strains that can actually grow on industry side streams. So they can use wood chips or straw or something else that's really cheap <laughs> as a source of energy. Because if you have to feed all of these microorganisms with sugar, your process is, is obviously going to be more um, resource intensive and more expensive as well. So that is, is a big area of, of development. There is currently still a bunch of value in having the right carbon source, so sugar, um, and formulating the culture media, so the solution that the microorganism lives in. Um, this is expected to go down if we can find microorganisms that can make more with less, basically. So that's the dynamic there. A lot of value in cultivation and DSP. DSP is downstream, downstream processing. So cultivation of microorganisms generally happens in a fermenter, a big steel tank, like the one that you would brew beer in. And downstream processing is what happens afterwards to get the microorganism out of that steel tank and make a food product out of it. Um, this, at the moment, still generates a lot of value. Most of this value is capex depreciation, so um, the fact that these machines that you need there are fairly expensive and are fairly new technology and need to be um, set up exactly for the organism that you want to use makes this a fairly expensive and fairly differentiated step of the value chain. So if you can do this well, you, cr you can create a bunch of value. Conversely, if you can't, um, this is what makes your product very expensive. So um, that is also something that some of our portfolio companies are working on, having better bioreactors, finding ways to finance infrastructure for cultivation and DSP, um, solving that, that challenge there. Um, okay, finally, animal cell-based, maybe the coolest and most futuristic of all the three options of replacing meat. Why not, uh, as I believe they ascribe this to Winston Churchill, um, a few people have been saying for a while, why the hell do we grow the whole chicken if all we eat is the breast? Like, why not just take the cells and grow the meat without all of the ethical problem of having an animal and without all the dirt and, frankly, waste that comes with making the whole animal, right? Cows are incredibly inefficient at converting calories into steak. You need about 25 calories of feed to make one calorie of steak. This is the most inefficient bioreactor in the world. We should be able to do better. So that's the whole premise behind cultivated meat. Um, cultivated meat at the moment is in a state where it, 50 years ago it was impossible. Today it is possible but very expensive. Um, what does very expensive mean? It means that you can go to a restaurant in Singapore and you can buy a salad that has cultivated meat chicken strips on it. 
So it is in some legislations, it's allowed to sell. There are some companies that are able to make this in quantities that are at least enough for a few fa fancy restaurants. It, it's gonna cost you double digit amounts of dollars to eat that salad um, and the company still probably doesn't make a profit off of it. <laughs> so it is still fairly expensive to make but it's not completely out of the range of what you would pay for a fancy steak um, in a fancy place, which is good news. Um, so what's needed to bring down the cost of making cultivated meat further and how is the value changing across the value chain? Um, again, there are two main sort of uh, bits here. One is finding cell lines that expand and differentiate quickly. So all of the cultivated meat companies that are out there at the moment are working each with their individual type of cell. Like they all have different cell lines. Some of them take cells from a living animal every couple of months. Some of them have stable cell lines that can live in the lab in perpetuity. Some of them use chicken, some of them use cows, some of them use embryonic stem cells, some of them use more mature tissue stem cells, so the cells that would like repair your tissue if you tear a muscle or something. Um, so there's different approaches here. And I think one thing that we're going to see in the industry over the next couple of years is a bit of convergence towards either one or a couple of cell types that work really well. Um, and then obviously if you are the one to find that, this is where you create a bunch of value. So finding cell lines that are um, quick to grow. The other thing that I have here is this huge block of value creation in growth media. Growth media is the food, if you will, for the cells. Um, so it's a nutrient solution um, that also contains a bunch of signaling molecules called growth factors um, that tell the cells to grow and divide um, more quickly. This needs to get a lot cheaper. The problem here is that these culture media have been developed for pharmaceutical applications. So people have been growing mammalian cells, mouse cells, human cells, what have you, in the lab for a while, but then it was always in pharma conditions where a lot of things matter, but cost is not one of them. <laughs> so pharma is famously cost insensitive, whereas food, if you can make the steak 50 cents cheaper, you are addressing a whole different market. So food cares a lot about cost, where, where, where pharma does not at all. So this is um, a journey that has to happen here, bringing down the cost of things like growth factors and what I would call protein inputs, insulin and albumin are, are all other in important proteins that need to go into this me uh, culture media that are not growth factors per se, but also still are fairly expensive and they need to, to get cheaper. So here, for instance, at Blue Horizon, we've invested in one company that is making growth factors in a novel production system that will allow them to make them a lot cheaper and at a lot larger scale than um, was previously possible. So this is the sort of value creation that we look for here. Um, cool, that was the very technical part of the presentation. So if you're mostly here for the non-technical part, then now you can wake up. <laughs> um, a little bit on how I got there. Uh, on the object level, uh, what have I done? I did a PhD at Oxford. Um, that was mostly an exercise in building career capital. Um, I was naively sort of thinking that doing molecular farming, so producing um, pharmaceutically useful molecules in plants would help solve global health challenges. I am no longer very much convinced that that is actually uh, a very effective way of addressing global health, mostly because the issue with molecular farming is not so much on the plant science side, but more on the um, human immunity side of things. Like you need to understand the immune system really well to be able to pull, up, pull off this type of technology. Uh, however, it was a great time. I had the time of my life during my PhD. I would totally recommend the experience if you are able to plan it well and have a good environment to do it in. Um, and I got a bunch of career capital. I then joined BCG. So I've been a management consultant for a while. This is um, for context, uh, I joined back in 2017. Um, so back in the days, this was still one of the recommended ATK career paths. <laughs> so I'm a little bit of a collateral damage of my time. <laughs> um, it was a very interesting time, I learned a lot. Um, I met a lot of people who had very, very different worldviews from what you would meet at this conference. Um, managed to make a bunch of money. So that was, um, yeah, I, I would say still a, a good step in today's framework, maybe not the, the first option anymore, but um, it was interesting to also scout the option space of what else is out there. I would have never found the job at Blue Horizon if I hadn't been at BCG before. 
um, is, is, I guess, one of the ways you could frame it ret retrospectively. And what I now do at Blue Horizon is, yeah, earning to give. So private equity pays horrendously well. Um, happy to discuss more details in person um, in a smaller round. Um, animal and climate impact, yes, replacing um, meat with alternative proteins is, in my opinion, one of the ways to address factory farming, which is probably one of the bigger moral disasters of today's time. As I say in my uh, bio, I believe I'm personally quite excited about safeguarding humanity's long-term future, so <laughs> you see that there's a little bit of a trade-off here as well between what is, I think, a pretty amazing uh, personal fit for the thing that I'm doing here versus um, what I think the most important thing to be working on is um, at the moment. So some of the ways in which I would probably change the investment thesis of my own fund if I have one one day um, is go more into things like biotech that fosters civilizational resilience and preventing global pandemics risks um, and, and those sorts of things. For now, I think the sort of dual uh, path to impact of earning to give and having a near-term impact on animals is, is pretty good. And yeah, further scouting the option space as well. It's super interesting to work with entrepreneurs and to see how founding a company actually works. I had very little insight into that before. It is, it is super interesting to learn about that. Um, so that's the object level of uh, where I am now and how I got there. A little bit on the more sort of tools level, things that I found useful along the way. Um, I am calling out three here. Scout mindset is something that I'm also giving a workshop on tomorrow. Um, it is a way of thinking about the world where you try to build a correct map of the world. So you try to build a picture of the world in your head that is as correct as possible um, while keeping your identity small um, and using tools of what is broadly known as rationality. There's the Center for Applied Rationality over in the US that teaches these tools. Um, I incorporate a bunch of them into, into the workshop that I do tomorrow, so if that's interesting, please come along. Um, I found these tools incredibly useful because they help me make good decisions, which is basically what investors get paid for in the end of the day, if, if, if you um, think about it, is making good decisions on where to deploy money and then making good decisions on what to tell that company to do with the money. <laughs> Um, so this is, is very useful there. Growth mindset, almost anything can be learned. Um, you can see from my sort of trajectory that, well, I was a scientist and then I was a consultant and now I'm an investor. And all of these kind of make sense together if you look at it in retrospect, but there was also a lot of, yeah, just showing up and asking stupid questions involved. <laughs> um, so realizing that almost anything can be learned was quite empowering to me. There are two um, resources here that I'd like to call out. Optimize.me is, um, is a bunch of vi very inspiring videos and, and what I find relatively useful tools from a guy called Brian Johnson. Personal development and coaching. I've done a lot of personal coaching. I'm a really big fan of that um, way of training yourself to be a better human and a more productive worker and a more altruistic altruist and a, well, a happier being, I guess. <laughs> um, so that is also one big and then conversations with inspiring people. I think that's especially important in the context of, well, we are at this conference and there's hopefully a lot of inspiring people here. So take the opportunity to get out of your own bubble, to talk to experts. Um, I found this incredibly useful over time. As I say, for instance, at BCG, I met a lot of people who maybe don't share a lot of my values, but had very interesting things to say about how the world works, um, how to manage stakeholder relationships, how to manage projects, how to hold yourself to high standards without burning out, um, these sorts of things. Um, so if you find somebody who is impressive along, uh, along a particular vertical of things that you might wanna learn, seek them out and talk to them. And if they don't agree with 90% of your other worldview, it doesn't necessarily matter. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think this is all I have for now. So um, the remaining 15 minutes, maybe 17 or something that we have, um, I would love to dedicate to you guys for questions, comments, reflections. Yeah. Um, we have one question on the chat. What is your forecast for when cost parity of flavor plus texture equivalent Alt chicken will occur in the UK, and what would shorten this timeline most effectively? <laughs> okay, that, that's very specific. Okay, <laughs> cost parity of flavor and texture in the UK, chicken. Um, 
So for plant-based chicken, um, it's very close already. If you compare um, some of the better products on the market, like uh, this isn't chicken, it's fairly good as far as I'm concerned. It's not one of our portfolio companies, by the way, um, <laughs> but it's, it's fairly good. Uh, the founders are a bit crazy, to be honest, but there you go. <laughs> I guess you need, you know, uh, genius and, well, anyway. Uh, that product is pretty good already, and if you compare the pricing to an organic chicken, the organic chicken pricing fluctuates a lot more because this gets priced on world markets, whereas the alternative protein one is a lot more stable. Um, but there were some times in the last 12 months when, especially when the global situation was quite volatile because of Ukraine, grains were quite expensive, chicken eat a lot of grain. So the organic chicken sometimes actually started approaching the price of the, of the plant-based substitute here. So I think there we're fairly close. With more economies of scale, the plant-based chicken is basically there. So the forecasts that I'm seeing for the facilities that our portfolio companies are building now already look like you can definitely undercut the cost of an organic chicken, possibly also the cost of a mass uh, produced factory farm chicken, just with larger facilities. So there, the, um, the key, I think, at this point is economies of scale. It's just making 50,000 of these packets is a lot cheaper per packet than making 50 packets. Um, that's uh, for plant-based. Maybe more interestingly for cell-based, um, so when can we grow a cultivated chicken that gets to the texture and the taste um, and to cost parity? In the reports that you can see on the QR code and on our website, um, we say, early 2030s for cost parity for cultivated meat. Um, I basically still think that's true. A lot of the cultivated meat companies say it's gonna happen earlier. Um, our job as investors is to be a little bit more conservative than the founders we work with. And also based on that, there's still a couple of technological questions that need an answer where it's not quite clear what the answer is actually going to be, especially around structure. So the texture, the, the fibers of the meat and how you can get that to grow in a bioreactor um, in a sustainable way without costing a ton of money is. There's still a bunch of challenges there that need to be um, answered by research, so it's not just about scaling up. Making a chicken nugget with some, some cultivated cells and some plant-based protein in there is a lot more about scaling up. So there it's like, yeah, we can do this. Um, I've tried some that were pretty good. <laughs> um, it's more about, you know, you need to grow the chicken cells at scale to make the cultivated part of this product a lot cheaper. And then you mix it with some plant-based protein and you're basically there. But to get to a fully cultivated chicken that is on parity in terms of texture and taste, yeah, there's a bunch of questions still to be answered. Mm. Yes, it, it depends on where you are in the world, but broadly, yes. In that graph, they don't f feature at all, because <laughs> um, there it's about uh, economics of, yeah, there, there, there it's about uh, value creation. However, yes, we do think a lot about uh, regulatory challenges. In the EU, it's pretty hard to be fair. Um, so cultivated meat is not, quite clear how it's going to be regulated yet. Uh, precision fermentation is clear in theory. However, in practice, some of the companies have faced issues because the proteins that they're producing via precision fermentation are allergens. Well, guess what? You're trying to make realistic milk. So you're producing a milk protein. It's going to be allergenic. Um, and the regulators don't like that because then it's going to be labeled as animal-free dairy and then they think that people might be confused. So there's a little bit of back and forth around that. Um, it's also a question of, you know, can you actually get to the point of producing, for instance, a dairy protein in a microorganism that is genetically engineered, but then purifying the protein from that organism, you theoretically end up with a non-GMO product if you can prove that there's very, very little left of the transgenic DNA that generated this protein, and hitting that threshold is, is still quite difficult for some of the companies, so in the EU it is a challenge. In the US it's a lot easier. Um, 
Nestle just launched a milk with a cultivated uh, protein uh, with, with a precision fermentation protein in there. So some of the precision fermentation companies are at the point where they can sell in the US. Impossible Burger famously has um, precision fermented heme, so the red color that gives meat this sort of bloody flavor and text uh, and, and smell and changes color while cooking and also binds iron, so it's quite important from a nutrient perspective. That red molecule is, is made and can be made in yeast, um, and that's what's an Impossible Burger. So in the US it's a lot easier. We do is expect a lot of other um, regions globally to follow the US rather than the EU approach. In this case, um, Middle East first and foremost, because they have a huge food security challenge and they see fermentation as one of the solutions to this. So we actually have a lot of very interesting, very active conversations with people over there um, because they are just struggling to feed their populations with high quality food um, given constraints around water and having to import a lot of stuff. So the fermentation is, is going to be regulated fairly favorably there, um, I think. Asia Pacific is another one where traditionally there has been more sort of pro-tech um, stance. But yeah, um, for the investment, like for the business case that we underwrite as investors, we very often just cut the EU out of it, to be very fair. It's a bit sad. I mean, it, so there's relatively little unified agenda. Um, there's, I, yeah, I mean, how much alignment? So Singapore, I think, has tried to establish themselves as a hub for novel foods, um, also because of food security challenges. Again, Singapore is a tiny place. Um, they import 90%, more than 90% of their food these days. They want to make more there, so they need technologies like cultivated meat and, and fermentation to make that work. Um, so they've sort of charged ahead and built a framework for how these products can be regulated. The US um, has the whole bioeconomy um, initiative that Biden now also dedicated serious money to. So again, there's a, a willingness there to establish the US as a technology hub and as a manufacturing hub and create good jobs at home, et cetera. So it's, it's different motivations that bring different jurisdictions to different um, yeah, ways of regulating these products. In Singapore and in the Middle East, it's food security. In the US, it's like we want to be um, yeah, technologically leading and create good jobs uh, on US soil. In the EU, it's like we want to be safe and environmentally friendly um, in a sometimes slightly convoluted way. <laughs> yes. No. Um, so I think there's multiple ways of looking at impact investing. Um, if you look at it the sort of traditional way where there's a trade-off between impact and returns, yes, you run into a lot of issues. Um, this is also why I believe that approach has very limited scope, to be fair. What we try to do at Blue Horizon, what I find most fascinating about alternative proteins, because I think they are one of the clearest examples of where this is the case, is we look for um, situations where the incentives are just fairly aligned. So making more of this product and making it profitable and building a profitable business around it is likely also the best thing from an impact perspective. And then conundrums like this IP sharing get approached from that perspective where you say, you know, yes, I could force my portfolio company to publish a lot more of what they've researched, 
possibly that would lead to them not being able to build a profitable business because they're not able to attract more investor funding to finance the scale up that is needed to bring down the cost, etc. So it might foster the overall industry in a diffuse way, but harm this one company in a pretty specific way. And then I just have to make a trade off. You know, in some cases, the trade off is get your portfolio company to publish the freaking stuff. Um, and put a patent on it so that it's protected, but they can still publish it or just publish a high level version that helps others without um, divulging too much of their secrets or get investors on board who are aligned with publishing things, you know, like there's so many ways you can solve this, but it's a trade off sometimes in the end of the day. Yes, that you have to make. I think for fundamentally for impact investing to work, you want to look for areas where there is clear alignment between growing a big business and having a huge impact, because otherwise it's just going to be yeah, very tricky. <laughs> So yes, there's, I mean, there's a bunch of activity in that space. There's an alliance in the Netherlands where they try to make cultivated meat technology work such that it might work for smaller communities, etc. It's, I think, technologically quite challenging to be very frank because the operation of a bioreactor is very different from operating a, like a, a cow shed. <laughs> um, it is a lot cleaner. It needs a whole different type of expertise. Um, as of today, it still needs a whole lot of like sterile environment and consumables and things that are very hard to come by on a traditional farm. Um, so for the nearer term, I think the trade off here is that, yes, we're going to have meat that is ethically produced, but that is not going to be, to be produced on, on farms and we're going to have to support farmers in different ways. So obviously this whole food system transformation is, is a much larger um, piece. It's not just cultivated meat. It's also things like, you know, people want to eat more local, people want to eat better quality food, um, also more plant-based. Frankly, plant-based is one of the things that leaves more value creation for the farmer to do because you are, instead of producing some pretty low value maize or, or soy that goes into cow's feed, you are now producing something that goes directly into a consumer product. So you have more um, room for value creation and differentiation there. Like your locally produced golden pea from the highland of uh, North Rhine-Westphalia is possibly going to be able to command a premium pricing, <laughs> whereas your rapeseed that is being fed to a cow is definitely not, um, because you're closer to the consumer. So I think farmers have opportunities here. That being said, I'm not gonna say farmers' lives aren't hard. <laughs> um, I, yeah, my, my grandparents were farmers, my parents still live on a farm, although they have different jobs by now because it was economically very difficult. Um, so it is like very tricky and I think it needs a lot of regulatory support. I think it can be done. Um, so supporting farmers in this transition is actually one of the key kind of policy um, instruments that we care a lot about at Blue Horizon and that we try to do some lobby work for. For instance, there's examples of um, European subsidies being allocated not based on the amount of hectares that you farm, but based on the amount of human edible calories that you produce. And that is a way to pr support farmers in a transition towards producing more plant-based foods on the farm and then possibly making cultivated meat in big hubs until that technology is maybe ready to also become more decentralized. Maybe it won't. Let's see. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I mean, yes, it is, a, it is, a, it, it is an ongoing discussion. And uh, yeah, I just really want to say that, yes, this whole thing needs to happen on the back of the farmers. So they totally need to be part of this. Um, and, and that's also something that we're very actively working on. What do the next couple of decades look like? Yeah. Like yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in my ideal world, <laughs> we get better alternative protein products, which enables people to resolve this cognitive dissonance of, I know that animal farming is kind of bad, but I still want to eat my steak. If I can still eat something that has the nutrition that I'm expecting from a steak, has the taste that I'm expecting from a steak, and I don't have to pay tremendously more for it, maybe I'm getting more ready for this societal discussion that I think we do absolutely need to have. 
around, yeah, it seems very plausible that animals suffer, and yeah, we really treat them pretty badly. <laughs> so um, I'm very much hoping that this is, that alternative proteins are a little bit like giving antidepressants to somebody who's very badly depressed to enable them to start therapy, something like that. <laughs> Um, so ideally this technology enables a, so uh, a societal debate that we absolutely need to have. We're not going to get around having the societal debate um, be simply because these technologies are not going to scale fast enough to replace all of meat consumption by like 2030. Um, it's more like a fifth or a quarter depending on how you, you run the numbers and how optimistic you are. Um, but that still leaves a lot of room for people to um, demand uh, better f farming practices, to switch to more plant-based foods um, all the way, to um, limit food waste, um, a third of all food is wasted these days, so that's also one of the challenges that, that come into play here. So for this whole food system to change in a way that is better for humans, animals and the planet. That's it?